this table. David, I'm going to read a little bit about you. You are a familiar face in the Eugene Peace community. David has lived in Eugene for 32 years, working tirelessly in many capacities to help move his life, his community, and our country toward the incorporation of peace the integral part of what we all are doing. During his academic years, it was a systematic design planning that David credits with helping to develop his ability to see the big picture and the details all at once. He says that his ability is one of the main reasons that the concept of a department of peace, doesn't that sound fantastic, a department of peace? This appeals to him because it involves holistic systems thinking. When asked about his formulative in excuse me, I'm going to put some glasses on here because <laughs> oh, I can't read as well as I used to. Okay, here we go. <laughs> when asked about his formative influences, David recalled a turbulent youth in a world gripped by the Cold War and a rageaholic father. His own issues with anger have served as a personal reminder of the terrible power that anger can exert on us all. As well as the truth of the axiom, peace begins within. It's an inside job. It's inside all of us. He didn't say that, did he? He saw the relationship between his father's violence and world violence as a communications problem and wanted to know how to solve the problem. It was during the 2004 election that David first learned about the idea for a Department of Peace while working with Dennis Kucinich's campaign. After joining local efforts, he eventually became a statewide coordinator and remained active in the work for several years, attending regional and national conferences. By 2009, he realized that the key to moving forward was to focus on a local grassroots effort aimed at building a city of peace. Right here at home in Eugene. It all started with one idea. His, appro his approach has moved away from a business model toward one that focuses on keeping the conversation going by building relationships, trust, and vision. The question, what would a city of peace look like in practice, is now what needs to be answered. David says, if I focus on the process, the results will take care of themselves. This is a personal reflection of Gandhi's encouragement that we should strive to be the change that we wish to see in the world. CMS is honored to present David with the 2001 Peace Builder Award. Let's recognize our friend.
And now peace is not easy right now because it's coming from the inside out in our culture like a cat punching its way out of a paper bag. And what we're doing is reprogramming an entire system with vast inertia. Uh, and that requires that we hold down the on button with all the resources of our care and attention. It's not easy. But I see we are entering an upward spiral of knowledge and abilities that will establish a U.S. Department of Peace someday. And it will promote worldwide the healthy growth and development of children, prosperity and safety for adults, as well as, and this is the most important thing, cooperative learning and problem solving by consensus. Such genius is going to flower in the human species that sometime from now, as we look back at this state that we were in, we are wondering why and how we were saved from extinction like the dodo. Um, I'm excited to be alive at this time. Um, because we are facing these crises of the economy, the environment, and the energy supplies. A great deal of attention has been focused right now on the misbehavior of the materially wealthy. However, the people who are truly most wealthy and powerful right now are the ones who have a wealth of community, friends, and partners. Which brings me to the topic of the occupation. The concept of 99% has created an instant community. And one of the people who started this in Eugene is sitting right here, Sam Chapman, and I all want you to introduce yourself to him. <laughs> There's much misunderstanding about the goals of this movement. It's, I want to say it's not a political movement. It's a movement of values. There's no general political strategy to this movement. It's not a struggle for victory over or modification of the status quo. And those kinds of goals are very short-sighted. There's no economic, political, or technological change using the current status quo that will produce a lasting change for our grandchildren. However, if we redefine wealth to mean friends and community, so that what is shared among us has more value than what is owned individually, then we can create an entirely new culture based on distributive justice, a fair share of security, prosperity, and quality of life for all. The occupiers have a great potential for solving, oops, <clears throat> for solving those problems without any money at all. And they are doing so in the present moment. They have created a sharing culture. And this is the revolution that's not being televised. Living a life of nonviolence, caring for each other as equals, and radical inclusivity right here, right now. One of my colleagues in the Compassionate City campaign, Eric Cowan, has said, we are building the community we want to live in, and we're doing it in public. Perhaps the most useful place to start is the place suggested by a lady in New York who was quoted as saying, Occupy your own heart, not with fear, but with love. So this impulse is taking place in the hearts of common people globally, and it's the authentic leadership we need for a better world. Our goal should be to acknowledge that we are all occupants. Let go of the notion that we are somehow not involved in the culture of money, power, fear, survival of the fittest, win-lose, and exploitation of nature and one another. It affects us all, the very air that we breathe. There are no spectators. World peace will arrive when we feel and know that we belong to all people, and they belong to us. We will then be the 100%. Thank you.